I, did you surf? I did. That's why I was late. I oh, apologize. Okay. Um, no apology needed. I have a, a new project working on and um, testing. So, mm. you know, you make something, you need to test it. Surf's been a little little tough to come by where I'm at right now. So um, it's like, wow, I could squeeze in a surf before we met today. Yes. Lowers? The board went well, yeah. Nice. Lowers. Um, lots, of, lots of pros out. So I just sort of sit underneath, inside and underneath and just take the leftovers. You know, if you sit outside on, it wasn't very big. It was like chest high, shoulder high. So if you're on a mid-length swooping in on waves outside, it's not a good look. So I just sit underneath and kind of pick off the little ones and uh, pretty excited about the new board. So you get a couple. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Nice. yeah. It's, um, uh, you know, it's always fun. You take notes, you're trying to compare boards that you just, you know, you make a magic one. Um, you, you scan one that you like, you know, usually you start off with a hand shape. Uh, what do we want to do? Let's just start over. Sky's the limit. Try a couple. Some of them work. Some don't. Oh, out of this. Okay. That one worked. Let's scan it. And then you scan it. And then from there, a lot of times the scan doesn't come out like exactly the same as you know, you're in the, in the blank industry and, and then you have to sort of chase that magic board. You know, it takes a, takes a little while. Yeah. You know, you go, oh, shit, make the first cut, you measure it. And I was always cynical about uh, scanning boards, you know, K the CAD machines. You know, I was like, oh, that's that's cheating and, you know, that's whack. And I know some shapers, like, really hang their hat on that. They're super anti-machine. And I love the machine because consistency. It's like, man how many times have you gotten hand shapes and you can't replicate them? It's just, I know a shaper or two who claim they can, but it's just, it's, it's really impossible. So it's a fun process of like, you get the magic one, you scan it. And then the little tweaks you have to do to get back to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can get really precise and it's, I've, I'm, I've found, and this is no mystery to anybody that shapes, they know way more than I do, but getting the curve is just so important. You know, when you can get that curve, the rest of it's just, I found easier to fix. Like, okay, how thick do we want the rail and all that sort of stuff? Which curve are you talking about? The outline? Uh, the, the rocker, sorry, from nose to tail. Gotcha. Um, so the profile. The profile, yeah. And it's just that there's that tipping point of too much entry, not enough. Too much tail rocker, not enough. And what, it's just, I, it's fascinating to get super into that. Well, that conversation about the machine versus the handshape, I feel like is almost not relevant anymore. It was for a long time, up yeah. until maybe five years ago. And then people, all of the people who were saying handshape is the only way to go because that's where the soul is. And the machine has no soul. Like that argument has been replaced by the most soulful hand shapers needing to increase their production to actually get surfers riding their boards. Like they had so yeah. many surfers wanting to ride their boards that they realized I can actually spend more time in the shaping bay refining my designs. Exactly. If I can outsource this process of whittling the blank into the general shape, yeah. and then I can refine the general shape down into where and make all these vast improvements from that point on. Yeah. And I can talk to clients. I can yeah. actually spend time with customers yeah. communicating it's been so. hard for a few people, but I think your, your timeline's about right. I, I'm really good friends with Josh Hall. And Josh Hall was handshape guy for a long time. Um, but they still are handshape. I think if exactly. you can change, yeah. like you're just making everything more consistent and accurate because once you find a model you like um, and then you can replicate that rocker profile, that's one of the most, to me, like I just said, it's, it's like the thing you feel immediately, mm -hmm. you know, and then, okay, now we can fine tune with the different types of uh, concaves or V's or whatever we want yep. to go into to give a different feeling. Put um, all of your time into the refining, yeah, not into whittling down a tree into a toothpick. You know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a few that still hold out and good on them, you know, like, and that's the beauty of, well, of having choices, but I want the consistency personally. And I think, Everybody could agree in that debate that you got to put some, you know, a thousand blanks maybe under your belt, hand shaping before you ever get to the machine. If I you're agree. gonna if you're gonna get into the business, you don't get in with the machine and on a software yeah. program. And I think, yeah, I think you're right. That's where a lot of the critiques 
came, you know, this was a hot topic five, six, seven years ago. And, you know, the Instagram shapers. Right. Um, that in, in people that only know how to design on Shaper, uh, what is it? Shaper 3D? Is that Shape 3D is Shape, one of them. Shape 3D or these different Aku. programs. Aku. Um, but it's really, I, I feel you've, once you've shaped a lot of boards, you've sort of earned your stripes. Yep. And I, I feel it is important to start with hand shapes and really come up with something fresh. But correct me if I'm wrong, but I think some of the top shortboard shapers do really start from the machine now. Um, I, I don't want to say any names, but I've just heard that some of the big names in shortboard um, shaping will not even really start with a hand shape anymore. And the reason that maybe you know more than me on this, the reason they do that is they get off and running with models quicker with team feedback. Um, the challenge of um, the hand shape scanning, then you're sort of chasing getting back to there. It's like right. a lot of extra steps. Have you right. heard that? Um, I would be apprehensive to say that some of the larger shortboard shapers, because I don't know that the largest ones got in that way. I think of the largest ones as being legacy I, I people. Mean, I'm sorry. Doing... I mean like in the last year or two where they've sort of shifted gears or not as worried about a hand shape or um, originating the new designs in the last few years. I don't, oh, mean, so a, established... I don't mean established you know, name any big shortboard shaper who's been doing it for 15, 20 years. Um, I've just heard through the grapevine that they have these big teams with CT surfers and they don't have time to mess around. Um, and that some of them are actually designing on the machine. And I've, I've just heard it brought up as a critique of like, that's really a departure. Like yeah. you should stick to the, the way this thing works best is we, protect or carry on the tradition or what's special about shaping is doing the whole thing from hand when, you know, let's say, you know, Hey, we got a new team rider. We're going to make a new model for that person. Let's just go back to the drawing board. We, you know, you talk to them, boom, sh you know, do a few and then go, aha, that's a magic one. Now let's replicate that. What I was saying is I'd heard that some of the bigger names now are actually skipping that. Gotcha. And I just wonder, Maybe you, you, maybe you just hadn't heard that. So. I don't know that I'd heard it, but I, I mean, I remember a conversation I had with Eric Arakawa specifically, and he said, it's actually easier for me to get in the room and just bang one out with a planer. Like yeah. if I'm talking to Jack Robinson sure. and he says he wants to make these adjustments, it's way faster for me to take a blank, go in the room with a planer and execute what he wants than it is for me to get on a computer and try to figure it out. Right. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. But I'm, yeah. I'm all for the CADs, but keep the hand shaping part for fine tuning. And, and even when you get the CAD, so many things can happen with how, how someone does the rail. I mean, there's still a lot is dialed in by totally. hand. I mean, so much of it is. So, you know, what's a far more interesting or relevant maybe conversation is that more hands, I guess more of the, how the board performs in the water is going to be affected by the lamination and the sander more True. importantly than the Point. laminator even. And so those are all processes that are still done by hand exclusively. There's yes. no automation to the lamination or the sanding. No. And so uh, if you if you really want kind of how your board, if you have those 10 boards for Kelly Slater trying to replicate one magic board, and here's 10 that Al is going to give him back in the day to try to replicate that one, it really more comes down to what the sander did than sure. what Al did ultimately. And if you have three or four different sanders in the factory, then they're going to be all different, you know? So that's where you really want to focus uh, your attention on yeah. is working with either somebody who is a shaper that does it from beginning to end by himself or has worked with his laminator and their gla uh, sander yeah. for a long period of time. Yeah, the sander's really clutch. I just, uh, it's funny you brought that up. I hadn't done or written anything in a magazine in a year or two, and I just a few months ago turned in a piece on, on surfboard sanders for the journal. No way. It was really great. It was a lot of fun. Um, I just, you know, interviewed four kind of highly regarded sanders. You probably know of most of these people. I had one, you know, there was one in uh, the East Coast, two in California, and one in Hawaii. And, um, yeah, I think people are going to, if whoever reads out there that reads the journal, I think they're going to really enjoy it because 
there was a lot more info that they shared than, I mean, I was kind of aware of the stuff, yeah. but like to like really push them on the questions and learn more than like, yeah, it's a hard job and you get dirty, you know, like just how important the edge set is For sure. and, and being able to, the big part of it was communication. Uh, you know, you can, you know, like shape a board, whether you're Al Merrick or whoever the shaper is and, you're right. It goes through, and if, if someone laminates it a little too heavy, or one of the big ones that can get screwed up a lot is fin placement. That is a really big deal. That's pretty easy to screw up. And totally. then finally, your sander. But there has to be really good communication. And so, you know, I've just um, firsthand watched it. You know, whether it was when I was at Donald Takayama's, and he had a couple of different sanders there, and he was really specific about where that edge went. You'd see Britt Merrick and this guy, Alex Banway, they would talk. You know, and they had this really good rapport. If you do not talk to the sander, and I've been part of those projects where you forget to talk to the sander, man, it, you're like, oh my God, the, the, the edge is gone or the edge runs too far up or not far enough. Yep. <laughs> it can destroy the board. Totally. Yeah. It tremendously affects the board's uh, yeah. performance in the water. I was One of my interviews I did with Dave Parmenter, he was talking about he's worked with the same sanders for a long time. So when he was in uh, building boards in central California, he'd send his boards down to the Waterman's Guild in Orange County yep. to be glassed. And he said it, he'd work with one specific sander and Dave would actually want a hard edge on whatever the board was or a sharp edge. And, but he would leave the shape soft because if you leave the hard edge on the foam, it makes the laminator's job harder. Yes. So he would leave the foam soft not sharp, knowing that the sander was going to make up for that in the end. But if yeah. you were a shaper who wasn't communicating with your sander, your sander would see the soft foam. Just follow it. And just follow it. Right. But he knew, right. hey, I'm just going to make the laminator's job easier by making this rounded, knowing that the sander will come and put that edge back on. Yeah. So little details like that yeah. take a long time to. I've also seen a laminator one time knock down the edge and didn't communicate it with the shaper. And that was, <laughs> I mean, but the laminator already knew that the sander knew what he was doing, but there wasn't communication with the shaper and the shaper's like, what the F man? Yeah. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> and but so, it worked out in the end. So think about this as listeners uh, who are just buying surfboards, where does, where does that board go? And that mistake happens all of the time or mistakes like that. So where does that surfboard go? The surfboard shaper can't afford to throw that thing away. They're not going to like throw it in the dumpster. So ultimately it's going to be sold. And if you don't have communication with either your shaper or have a reputable retailer whose sales team is knowledgeable that you could trust that are working with board builders whom they have reputable relationships with, then you might end up buying one of those boards or it might end up, maybe it's a discounted board somewhere, you know? Yeah. So as the consumer, uh, you need to be aware of these things and you need to actually be your own advocate for getting the best board. My favorite way is working with a shaper yeah. personally. 